Hi, my name is Kevin Larry. I'm the head coach and owner here at Allied Strength in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Today, we're going to be expanding on one of the most popular concepts from the previous talk that I gave on effective warm-ups for student athletes to maximize performance and reduce the risk of injury. And that concept is, of course, building strong breaks. So if you haven't already, I recommend that you go back and watch that previous talk on effective warm-ups. Wherever you're watching this video, there should be a link to that video. And you can always go to alliedstrength.com, go to the article section on there. You'll have the full video, plus all the exercise videos that accompany it, plus the PowerPoint presentation, so you can follow along with the slides, just like with this talk. So, uh, as we go forward, just want to quickly run down some things. First, thank you, because this is probably going to be about a one-hour lecture, and I promise you're going to get tons of value from it. I'm not here to waste your time. I'm here to give you valuable, actionable information that you can use, whether you're an athlete, a parent, coach, strength coach, personal trainer, uh, if you work in athletics at all, and a lot of this stuff is going to be great for you know, both athletes and adult populations, so you can have some carryover there too. Uh, but again, thank you for your time because I know we're all very busy today, so thank you for taking the time to watch this. Um, also, the slides, like the previous talk, uh, will be available at alliedstrength.com. Wherever you're watching this video, there should be a link to download the PDF of the slides of this presentation. So you might want to pause, download that real quick. You might want to print it out or at least have it so you can follow along and take notes as we go. Uh, and also all the videos that were shot specifically for this talk are on the Allied Strength YouTube channel. Again, link for it is on alliedstrength.com. You're probably watching this on YouTube so you can see where our channel is as well. Uh, mentioned the effective warm-ups talk. And of course, uh, if you're in the Cape Ann area, if you're watching this, if you're an athlete, a parent, or a coach, and you're looking for sports performance training, obviously that is something that we offer here at Allied Strength. We'd love to have you come down, check out the facility, you know, see how we can best help you, uh, your son or your daughter, if they're an athlete, or if you're a coach, to help out your team. Uh, so never hesitate to, to reach out. And that's the last thing, Kevin at AlliedStrength.com. No matter what your question is, uh, follow-ups on this talk, uh, just general questions about sports performance, adult group training, whatever it might be. Never hesitate to shoot me an email, kevin at alliedstrength.com. That's how we can get the ball rolling. And then I'd always be happy to set up like a Skype call if you're on, you know, far away or to set up an appointment for you to come into the gym and talk in person. But that's always the best way to get a hold of me is through email and then we can have a more in-depth conversation after that. So today's discussion, I don't even know if this is a word. I don't think it is. Uh, Microsoft PowerPoint said it wasn't, but uh, reconceptualizing performance training. I want you to kind of change the way that you think about performance training. We'll get to that in a second. Of course, building stronger breaks, starting at the warm up all the way to conditioning. So that's from the warm ups, activations, dynamic warm up, core strength training, and then conditioning as well. Really important part in there. We're going to keep it simple. We're going to keep it useful. Like I said, uh, like with the previous talk, I think it's really important that. You can do all this stuff with no to minimal equipment. Of course, there's going to be some strength and conditioning exercise or strength training exercise that we're going to need you know, additional load for. Uh, but a lot of this stuff you can do in a team setting as part of your warm up, as part of like your, your team strength and conditioning stuff that you could even do like on the field for like 15 minutes uh, before or after practices. So I want it to be very useful. So. This is how we usually think of uh, elite athletes. We always talk about their incredibly strong engines, but oh man, that athlete can really move. They're very explosive. They get a great engine, right? And of course I'm using you know, people, if you know me personally, I'm a big fan of the Fast and Furious franchise. So it's a little, little image from that. But that's what we always are talking about. We're always talking about how like incredible these engines are in these athletes. But I think it's super important that we don't just focus on the engines because if you look at high performance cars, if you want to go along with that analogy, every high performance car might have an incredible engine in it, but it also has performance brakes to back it up. Because if you don't have the brakes to back up that engine that's under the hood, then what happens? You crash, right? You're out of control. You need to be able to control the horsepower of that engine. Otherwise, it's really useless. It's really useless or you're going to find it in the body shop a lot to get fixed up. So to continue with that analogy, engine brake balance. All right, so uh, are your brakes strong enough for your engine? That's what I want you to think about today. And I want you to think about when it comes to performance training. You know, if you're thinking about just building really explosive athletes, 
are you also helping them build the brakes to team up with those engines so they can slow down? Uh, and what that means in our world is making sure that they're not constantly getting injured, that they don't have nagging injuries that follow them throughout the season. They're not the athletes that are always, you know, pulling their hamstrings or dealing with knee issues. Like this is the stuff that we need to really consider when we're developing strength and conditioning programs or just doing, you know, strength and conditioning in general. So again, what happens when your brakes aren't strong enough for your engine? You crash, right? So another way that we think about this in the, the strength and conditioning world is like strength ratios, like uh, uh, a hip dominant to knee dominant ratio. Like we'll try to make sure we balance our exercise selection to best make sure that we're not uh, becoming too knee dominant with what we're doing in terms of our strength and conditioning. We need to make sure we're also doing hip dominant drills which are going to be making use of our hamstrings and our glutes and our adductors, uh, which we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, and again, you know, you, you, you know you're the future. Uh, I'm in the present right now, but you're in the future, so you know how long this video is. Uh, we're going to spend some time going in-depth on some of this stuff, uh, but I think it's really valuable to have just a, a well-rounded knowledge of this. So the primary breaks of the lower body, uh, the glutes, commonly underdeveloped, neglected, and, uh, excuse me, commonly underdeveloped and neglected outside of strength training. And why is that? It's because uh, a lot of the things that we would normally do or athletes would do outside of a strength and conditioning or like a weight room or strength and conditioning program, it tends to be, I mean, think about it. They're probably doing some running. Uh, they might be doing some, maybe some push-ups or something like that, but it's usually some jogging, some running. They're probably doing like uh, skills and drills type practice which is basically just doing, you know, small components of what their sport consists of. And a lot of that is just going to be, you know, forward momentum. It's just going to be that kind of like running or jogging concept that we're talking about. Um, so they're not really doing any kind of glute development. I, again, been doing this for, for a long time. You know, I've been working with athletes for over a decade and almost across the board, what you will see is athletes that are really unstable. Uh, they have a, a kind of an inability to balance on one leg, which means, you know, with their knee slightly bent, can their hip actually stabilize? That's really, really important, especially when it comes to deceleration, which we'll continue to talk about. And we're not going to go super in depth on anatomy or kinesiology because that's, I don't think that's super valuable, especially if you're like an athlete, a parent, or a coach. If you're a strength, in, uh, a strength coach or you're in the world of strength and conditioning or, or or fitness and training, this stuff is incredibly important to know. Uh, but for today, we're just gonna go over it uh, very generally. So uh, when we talk about the muscles of the glutes, like a lot of times people will say, you know, you know, fire your glutes. The only thing I want you to remember is that the glute isn't a muscle. It's actually a group of muscles. Same thing with your quadriceps, your hamstrings, your adductors. It's actually uh, groups of muscles that work together and that have common uh, uh, abilities and have common jobs for our body. Uh, so we actually don't have the glute min, which would be a, a right underneath there. Um, but I think it's just also important to kind of just see, you know, what we're working with in terms of muscle physiology. So again, uh, adductors. Adductors are super important to talk about uh, because you know, especially if you're in the, the sport of hockey, you know, how common it is, uh, how common is it that, you know, a hockey player is going to have groin pain. And if you go into a locker room at a hockey game at any level, you can pretty much say, you know, who in the last two weeks has had groin pain? You'll probably have every player on the team raise their hand. And part of that is the nature of the sport, but that doesn't mean we can't be programming, you know, against what the sport is demanding, or I guess programming for what the sport is demanding to make sure we can reduce that adductor discomfort or that groin pain that comes along with the sport. Um, so again, this, these are some of the most common injuries that we see in athletics, especially youth athletics, is you know pulled hamstrings, uh, groin discomfort or pulling their groins, uh, and also knee discomfort. Like those are the ones that we're gonna hear the most about. Um, and they're usually non-contact injuries, right? It happens when they're decelerating or trying to slow down or trying to change direction. And again, just really important that we know it's a family of muscles. It's not one muscle, but it's a family of muscles working together. I don't want you to fall asleep. We'll keep going. Uh, 
So hamstrings, again, same deal. A hamstring pulls, how common is that? Every, I won't, that, that's the generality. We won't use generalities. But usually what will happen is uh, when athletes pull their hamstring, it will be when they're decelerating, when they're slowing down, like they need to come to an abrupt stop. That's where they're going to pull up lame and feel like they pull their hamstring. Uh, and a lot of times what is happening is that if you want to think of those hamstrings working as a brake, those quads are the engine, all right? Those quads are the engine that are driving them forward. And again, if you want to get very nerdy about this stuff, and I love to do it, you know, those quads are also helping decelerate when their foot goes back into the ground eccentrically. But the primary brakes are those glutes and those hamstrings. And if they're not strong enough compared to the engine that is outputting that power, what happens is they kind of like give out. Right, so that's why it's so important to make sure that we're strengthening those hamstrings, strengthening those glutes, strengthening those adductors and getting them ready to put on the brakes. So again, I mentioned the accessory brakes briefly, quadriceps, calves. Uh, we usually do a pretty good job of training these in sport and day to day. Uh, you know, I talking to an athlete the other day about running hills, like they're running hills, that's very quad dominant. Uh, running uphill on a treadmill, running in general, um, you will usually find athletes that, you know, have relatively strong quads compared to their glutes and hamstrings. Um, but what they're not necessarily doing is, you know, again, I, I'm not at every practice. I'm not in every strength and conditioning room at every, you know, high school and college around the world. Uh, but they're not always doing hip dominant type stuff. Like they're not always doing single leg deadlifts and strengthening those glutes and hamstrings or making sure that we're doing like really, like we'll talk, uh, actually I don't think we're gonna go super in depth on single leg training, but you know, this is one of been the best benefits of me you know, working with Mike Boyle for eight years is that I got so much exposure and so much knowledge about the benefits of single leg training uh, because with single leg training as well, it is just, uh, again, we might go on a tangent here and there, but with single leg training, it's so great, like with a split squat, a real foot elevated split squat, like that descent part of the pattern when you're lowering yourself or kind of coming down on the ground, you're actually building up those brakes as well. Like that, those are gonna actually be, you know, rather demanding of your, your glutes and your hamstrings as you go into deceleration. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a little bit. Um, but again, you know, I wanna kind of keep this going. I know this is gonna be uh, kind of a, a long chat. But one more analogy, you know, if we're thinking about uh, the power output that our body is capable of, you know, to sprint with those quads and calves, then we ask to transfer that power as we decelerate into the ground, then our glutes and hamstrings are trying to decelerate us. You know, if they're uh, significantly weaker, that's gonna be a really big problem. So deceleration and force transfer. Uh, in sport, there's usually two types. There's uh, voluntary and reactionary. So voluntary is usually if you're doing like conditioning or something like that and you're just running like a 40 or something like that and you just, you run the 40 and then you, you slow down. You slow down on your own pace. You know, that would be voluntary, right? Uh, but what is a lot more common is reactionary deceleration, uh, especially in sports when you are teamed up one-on-one -on -one, uh, in a defensive offensive setup like in soccer, like in hockey, like in basketball, uh, in football, pretty much you know, every sport that is a, a team sport where you're gonna be teamed up with someone uh, on the opposing team, you're having to basically try to track where they're going and then move with them. So you're reacting based on their change in movement, their change in direction. Uh, so that is reactionary, so we're not, uh, voluntarily slowing down, we actually have to stay with our opponent as best we can. Uh, and again, that reactionary deceleration is usually where we're gonna see those injuries pop up. And I think this is super important to talk about because uh, the realities of youth training, whether it be in, in middle school, high school, or college, the realities have completely changed, uh, really for the better. Uh, first, we're seeing and I think I mentioned this later, but we'll talk about it now. I think it's relevant to talk about now. But we're seeing organizations like in youth hockey where they're requiring at least one day a week of off ice time because what we're seeing 
is athletes are getting no strength training. What they're doing is they're playing their sport year round in multiple leagues during the week. There's things popping up like in baseball or softball where players will be playing in multiple leagues. So they'll have a, a pitch limit in one league in one game on Saturday. Then they'll be playing in a different game on Sunday in a different league with a completely different pitch count. And then we wonder why kids are getting Tommy John surgery at 14, 15 years old. Um, it's because wear and tear. They're just actually getting so incredibly tired, so fatigued that uh, all these injuries are, are popping up. They're not building. What I've uh, come to like talk a little bit more about is like building up armor for all the things that your sport's going to throw at you. You're building up this armor that not only your sport, but you know, and again, like this is always, 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 I think it's super important to mention that coaches, when they put in conditioning, it's always incredibly well-meaning. Uh, sometimes it's punishment, but usually it's well-meaning to prepare the athletes for the next game. But sometimes as a strength coach, we're kind of in the position of having to build up armor for the athletes so they just don't get hurt during conditioning or they can actually deal you know, with the rigors of the conditioning that the coach would put them through for, for practice. Um, but this will make more sense as we go forward. So you know, this is the ideal situation. An athlete has attentive coaching, they have structured programming, extensive warm-ups, movement skills, speed, agility training, power development, plyometrics and med ball stuff, uh, strength training and conditioning. Like they're doing that two, three or four times a week if it's the off season, uh, that is ideal. That is gonna get them uh, not only faster, not only stronger, but it's gonna help them reduce their risk of injury. And again, deal with the rigors of their sport, not just like the non-contact stuff, but also, if there is a collision in a game, like it will allow them to, you know, build up that armor. Like think about some of the the best athletes in their sports; they're usually the ones that are stronger, uh, not necessarily always faster, but they are stronger and they stay healthy all the time. And here's the good: uh, little to no coaching, no structured programming. Uh, programming. They just write something on the whiteboard. You know, that's kind of really common in, in high school sports. They'll just, you know, have a program that's written up on a whiteboard and they'll just go and do it. Um, access to a weight room at school, though, which is awesome. Uh, a local health club, if you, if you have access to a local health club or a YMCA, that's awesome. You got access to some free weights, uh, maybe some machines and cardio equipment. So there, there are so many athletes out there that want this stuff. They really do want an off-season training program, but it's sometimes tough to find a good structured program or to get access to the proper equipment that they need to do it. And this is most, uh, this is usually what, what's happening though. Uh, you know, bad, little to no weight training, maybe some machines or exercise they picked up from a magazine or just some cardio, you know, running on the treadmill or, or running outside, excuse me, if it's nice out. And then ugly, this is more common than it should be. The preseason conditioning sessions where everyone runs until someone throws up. Uh, I had an athlete not two weeks ago tell me about their preseason training being this, uh, being, you know, luckily they were coming here and doing their strength and conditioning. But, you know, what happened was, you know, there are some kids that, you know, don't do any off season training. They just wait till their season comes back and they kind of usually plan to just do their uh, preparation in those first two or three weeks before their first game. They just do a bunch of conditioning uh, and practice. And you know, sometimes what coaches will do is they'll just run the kids until someone throws up. They'll just run them until someone throws up and that's when conditioning will end. And that's just, I just, you know, again, talk about the benefits of, of working with Mike Boyle for, for almost a decade where you know, he has all these, these, these great analogies and this idea of this book is start with why. Like, why would you be having the athletes do that much conditioning? Like, what is the benefit of it? Like, can you give a clear and concise explanation of why you would have them run until someone throws up. If you have one, okay, yeah, I'm willing to, to listen. Um, maybe that kid was just really out of shape. Maybe he didn't sleep much the night before. Maybe he had a really big like snack before going to practice. Um, but you have to have a really good why for all this stuff. So I think this is a good thing. I really do. I think this is a good thing. Strength and conditioning is becoming more standard to compete. Uh, again, from working at a place like MBSC in Woburn, uh, where there's just like hundreds of athletes, especially in the summer, uh, because it's now becoming what is needed to compete 
at a, uh, uh, even a freshman level, but especially a JV and a varsity level in high school, and you know, exponentially more in college. Um, it's becoming more standard to compete. Um, and like I mentioned with the hockey uh, organization, sometimes even required by leagues and organizations. Um, and while this is a very good thing, it changes the standards. So what's happening, and I hate this part, I hate this part of, of you know, this, this, whole, uh, this whole concept, but what happens is some athletes that really love their sport are being left behind, which sucks, I hate that. Uh, because back in the day, now again, I take this very personally because you know, when I was a freshman and a sophomore in high school, I was really overweight, I was really out of shape, and I struggled to just stay on the basketball team. I struggled so hard until I found fitness and I was able to make some really big leaps with that. Um, but what's happening now is that there's some athletes that absolutely love playing their sport, but they're not making the team or they're seeing their playing time greatly diminished or they're getting hurt mid-season and then they're out for you know, multiple games or a big part of the season or all of the season, they're, they're kind of being left behind because the standards are changing. It's really important. This is why you know, I'm giving this video away for free is I'm hoping you know, some athletes, some parents, and some coaches out there you know, around the world will take some of the stuff in this video and implement it as soon as possible. And it's why I wanted to make it as simple as possible and easy to do on the field or on the court or off the ice. Um, because you know every athlete needs to be doing this stuff now. It's so so important, um, but again, I think it's good because it's pushing more organizations, more teams to having some strength and conditioning component. Something's better than nothing. Bad is better than nothing. Okay, so I want to make that super clear. Um, but I'm always kind of the person that's like, you know, if there's a better way to do it, why wouldn't we do it the best possible way? I think that's always a good way to think things. So. As athletes get to JV and varsity, it will often separate them from the rest of the team. And you know, the way that I've talked about the, the program that uh, I'm doing here at Allied Strength, and it was a really important part for me when I was at Mike Boyle's training and conditioning, like at, towards the end, working mostly with middle school athletes, um, is helping out those athletes that are just on the fringe of making the team. Uh, the athletes, again, that really want it, but you know, they just need to get in, in shape. They need to, maybe they weren't as uh, athletically gifted genetically, you know, helping them with a strength and conditioning program can not only be incredibly powerful because it can get them on the team or get them from the bench to some good playing time or some good playing time to being a starter. It's so empowering. I've seen it for, like I said, for over a decade, how empowering strength and conditioning can be for youth athletes because it makes them more confident on the field, on the court, on the ice, and uh, it helps them socially as well. Like this is something that transcends sports, whether, and again, not to go on, off on tangents, but uh, even with adults, like seeing changes in the adults that I've trained here uh, because they've been able to do push-ups or been able to do chin-ups or deadlift 200 pounds, like that stuff is uh, just, is so transitional into the rest of their lives. I think it's, it's why I love doing this stuff. It's, it's why I, I, this is the best industry to work in. Sorry, again, not to get all, all passionate and crazy on you guys, but okay, so let me go back. We're about to get into the good stuff and the, the, the good, useful, actionable solutions. Um, but this is the problem is that also like we have to deal with the realities of athletes having very limited time. They're in school for you know, six or seven hours a day. They might be commuting from a long way. Uh, they're obviously gonna have homework. They're gonna have tests and stuff to prep for. Um, so their time is, is very valuable and also very limited. So it's important that we're very strategic in how we program to make sure we're getting the best bang for our buck and making sure that if they can only train once a week or only train twice a week, that we're getting them the maximum benefit from it. So building stronger breaks starts with the warm up. Starts uh, as we go into uh, activation, dynamic warm up, speed and agility work, plyometrics, strength training, and of course conditioning. So all this stuff is super vital. It's super super vital to go over all these different aspects of what we do because again, there's 
different drills and different movements that we can do across the board, starting at the warm up and going to conditioning, that can help these athletes benefit and build stronger breaks. And also, when, uh, I'll save it, I'm gonna jump ahead of myself. So, uh, activation, you know, all you need is about five minutes. The goal is to wake up muscles before demanding performance. We talked about this in the previous talk. Again, if you haven't, I recommend going back to that. But just briefly, again, I mentioned athletes might be spending six or seven hours at school, in class, sitting down at a desk, they sit down at lunch, they sit down at the computer, then they might have to sit down and do some homework, then they might sit on the bus to go to the game, then they're sitting on the bench while the JV team plays and the varsity team plays. They're doing a lot of sitting down. What's happening is like their glutes are basically being shut off for the whole day. And then we're asking them to compete at an incredibly high level. And that's not really fair to ask of our glutes because we basically shut them off all day. So it's so important that we do some glute activation as part of our warm-up to make sure that they're prepared to, again, be breaks, to stabilize our hip. That's really important. So our goal is to wake them up, glutes, hamstrings, uh, core, and shoulders. Also, sometimes this can be uh, a result that we get from the dynamic warm-up. Like I think crawling patterns, uh, both forward and lateral, are super beneficial because you know, it's core stability in terms of the warm-up and it's shoulder stability in terms of the warm-up. And again, that's a really good uh, example of like building that armor. So in a basketball game, if you're jumping for a rebound and you, you know, bump into someone else, like you're less likely to hurt your shoulder or to hurt your low back. Or if you fall down, you're less likely to hurt your low back or to, to bug your shoulder if you're catching yourself when you, when you land. That's why it's so important to also warm up in uh, those shoulder stabilizers too. So now uh, we'll get into the videos and we'll break things up uh, from section to section of the program that you can use. And some of this stuff might be review uh, from the previous talk that we did, but uh, I promise we will go quickly through the stuff that's review and get to the newer stuff, but I think it's still important. So our two leg hip lift, again, I mentioned in the previous uh, discussion we had, but you can keep athletes at a two leg hip lift forever. You never need to progress to the single leg version that I'll show in a second, but it's really important because we're always going to watch out. We're going to watch out for those straight lines, those 90 degree angles. Uh, we want to make sure those glutes are firing, heels down, toes up, toes pointed back towards your knees. Um, I never really understood why some people still keep their feet flat on the ground because if you go into dorsiflexion or have your toes pointed back towards your knees, it's a lot more effective for glute activation, uh, glute recruitment to get those glutes firing. Um, and then also we're gonna watch out to make sure that those you know, feet aren't pointing out. We wanna keep those feet pointing straight ahead. Again, really great. You can do you know, two or three 10 second holds. You can do reps. You can do like you know, two holds for two seconds, come back down, hold for two seconds, come back down and do like five or six of those reps. Uh, again, I, I like to kind of break it up. Uh, some more glute activation stuff. Talked about these before, buy mini bands from Perform Better. They're very inexpensive. You can buy a bunch for a team warm up. They're really, really great and they're uh, really versatile in what you can do for the warm ups. But I love this mini band walk uh, begin, because you can basically have the athletes do it. And as long as they're doing this, as long as they're stepping to the side, those glutes are more or less forced to fire. As long as they're not picking up their hip and taking big steps, we wanna keep their feet really close to the ground. And that's why I put in like detailed instructions in all these videos. Because if they're doing that, their glutes will be activated. You know, their glutes will be waking up. It's still really good to, uh, again, just have some exercises that just work. Like they just work like an anti-rotation press, uh, where if they're, as long as they're pushing that thing out, you know, their core is forced to fire. Otherwise, they'd be, you know, firing back, turning towards the opposite direction. Love the band resisted body weight squat. Uh, again, with the band, like you guys probably saw the previous video, but we're forcing people into an error, trying to have force their knees to cave in. So we're making them course correct because it's very common that when athletes squat, if they are uh, you know, weak, uh, if they're not able to stabilize their hips, what happens is their knees cave in. Same thing when they jump. So when we force them into the error with this, uh, they're basically made to course correct, to do it correctly. Otherwise, the error would be so subs uh, substantial. And this allows them to get some actual feedback. They can actually feel what is going on when they're being forced into the air. So it's, again, I think it's a super, super good drill. Again, another reason to have some, some mini bands, uh, you know, from Perform Better. So going to the dynamic warm up, um, and also I will say like, this is not the whole dynamic warm up that I would have an athlete do these dynamic warm ups and everything else we're gonna talk about. 
uh, including those activations, is focusing just on building strong brakes. Okay, um, so talking about drill, uh, drill specific to today's uh, concept, refer to the effective warm up seminar. Now, again, mentioned that before, as you can skip by that. So. Again, that's our forward crawl, really great. Trying to keep that back flat, opposite arm, opposite leg. Uh, we're not rotating at our hips. Awesome, awesome drill to warm up. Uh, you can also do a six point version with your knees on the ground. Um, but uh, I believe that even a kind of rough version of that, because especially athletes that are not very strong, that haven't done any of this stuff before, it's not gonna look perfect. You can. Uh, do your best to try to have it look good, but it might not look great. Even good is going to be really beneficial as long as it's not super sloppy and it's not causing them like low back pain and things like that, which you shouldn't. Reverse single leg deadlift. That's our reaching reverse SLDO. Really good. Knee slightly bent. Really important. A lot of athletes, excuse me, and even I see some coaches in our industry, they do it with a straight leg. That makes absolutely no sense because we need that knee to be slightly bent for that hip to stabilize for us. When Let's go back to this real quick. I can't remember if I mentioned this in the previous talk, but if you just straighten out your leg, what you're doing is you're trying to create artificial stability in that limb, okay? You're trying to straighten that leg out that you think you're gonna be stable with that leg straight. But to stabilize that leg, what we really need are those hip, uh, those glutes to stabilize our hip while we're doing it keeping our weight shifted on our heel and not on the front of our foot. Again, all these are on our YouTube channel. You can grab them there. If you need them for download, just email me. I'll just email them to you so you can download them. Uh, back pedal reactive sprint. Uh, again, this is a great drill because when we talked about uh, reactionary stuff, this is what athletes might need to do. They might need to like basically react based on the opposing athlete. So the way that you would coach this is that you'd have them go into a back pedal. You'd say, go, to have them go into the back pedal. And then you would pick a spot, not the same spot every single time, because then athletes will just react and they'll try to get trained to where you're gonna say it. But like in different spots, so like sometimes, like even after like four back pedals, like one, two, I'll say, go right there. So they have to like really react almost uh, like incredibly fast. But these are really good because you have to decelerate then change direction and it's really really uh like again easy to implement in a team setting on a field to get them warmed up for what they're going to be doing in the game lunge circuit is great uh again as you go down to the ground you're decelerating that back glute is stabilizing for you it is allowing you to decelerate under control what you don't want to do is have that knee slamming on the ground like you should really be controlled the whole time. You can even kind of slow those down and turn them to the tempo. We'll see that in an eccentric version a little bit. Um, but these are great. You know, you can stay static. You can make it dynamic by stepping into each one of these positions every single time. But these are great because, again, it's, you know, warming up our hamstrings, primarily our glutes and our quads. Uh, but they're fantastic. Lunges are just such an amazing exercise because we get so many benefits from it. Again, it's, it's why uh, I think it's just, it's absolutely brilliant to stick exclusively with single leg training as much as possible aside from doing, you know, your uh, kettlebell or your dumbbell goblet squats as you build up some strength in young or untrained athletes or a trap bar deadlift. Um, but, you know, Lunge variations, single leg deadlift variations, or pure single leg squat variations are fantastic. And again, uh, I, uh, this is where I should mention this. I, I usually mention it when we get to the strength and conditioning portion, um, but with some of these drills, like we can go back to the uh, two, whoa, excuse the crap out of me. Uh, I, the gym is next to a place that works on cars. Uh, <laughs> they're obviously testing something out. But now, are you awake too? I don't know if that came across in the microphone, but I'm awake. So anyways, uh, what I like to do is make sure that I mention that every progression needs to be earned. It, you don't have a right to go on to a harder version of an exercise. You must earn that right to go on to the harder version of an exercise by showing proficiency in the current movement pattern, okay? So like I mentioned before, actually we can go back to this real quick. Jeez guys, my heart. 
<laughs> uh, like you could go into a more dynamic version where you're like lunging forward, return to that starting position. But I would never progress someone there until they're doing this perfectly. We'll see this more in the strength training portion of what we're gonna talk about. But that two leg hip lift to the single leg hip lift, if you can't show me proficiency that you can do that two leg version perfectly, I'm not even going to attempt that single leg version. And even if we do attempt the single leg version, it doesn't look great. We can always revert back to that two leg version because it's important that we have quality. You know, again, you don't have to just make things harder and harder and harder. Quality reps are really beneficial and you can build up volume with that. So speed drills, uh, again, another five minutes. Uh, common mistakes, I, I think, you know, Speed drills are usually thought of as just like, you know, you do speed drills to get faster, but I think it makes a lot more sense as speed drills being ways to uh, be more efficient with your movement, like being able to decelerate and change direction efficiently versus, you know, just like thinking, oh, my feet are moving faster. That's not necessarily the case. We'll talk about that in a second. So what's the goal of the speed drills? Uh, movement efficiency. Athletes who are bad at decelerating are slow. Uh, of course, you could have athletes that have, you know, if we want to go back to the concept of weak engines, yeah, they might be slow because they're not able to output a ton. But what you will see very often is athletes that are bad at decelerating are just super inefficient. You'll see this like if you run a shuttle run or a suicide where athletes will do like more of a U-turn versus doing a quick crossover, which we'll see examples of in a second. So our one, two stick reactionary uh, again. So as a coach, I would say, go, go. Hopefully I would be reacting faster than that or your athletes would be re reacting faster than that. I tried to time that right and I didn't. Um, but with this, what we're doing is we're making the athlete react based on the coach's go. And then they have to decelerate and stabilize, catch themselves, decelerate and stabilize. And for that, you know, you could do you know, two sets do like five on each side. Doesn't need to be a ton. Again, another uh, misconception is that you need to, need to do a lot of this stuff. You really don't. Just make sure you get in like two rounds of five on each side. That will be perfect. We'll talk about that more when we go to plyos. So our crossover. This is a crossover is our uh, building up the skill to make quick direction changes. And you'll see this more when we go to a 510. So we're, this is skill acquisition. We're teaching the athlete to quickly change direction and decelerate while they're doing it. Do it one more time. Hard push under, crossover, boom, stabilize. And you'll see actually we'll reset there. And that's also uh, another important thing for coaches out there. Always give your players, your you know athletes, your adults, the ability to reset because you never want them to go and try to do a speed drill in a compromised position. Like if they finish with their feet super wide, you don't want them to be trying to push under from there because guess what? Now that's where you're going to have that adductor strain, that groin discomfort. So this is our 5-10 or 5-5 five, five drill in my case. Boom. So again, look at we're decelerating and it's a good slow-mo of this. Hard push under with that inside right foot, crossing over the left, boom, hard push under. Decelerating with that inside left, then push under with it and cross over with the outside right. See, that change in direction, that quick change in direction is what will separate slow athletes from fast athletes. The athletes that we think of like first step quickness or being able to just change direction to lose their defender, that is going to be a big part of it. Uh, ladder drills, again, you know, a lot of people think of it as, you know, basically improving foot speed, but what it is, is usually coordination is a big part of it, especially for untrained athletes. Ladder drills can be great for coordination, but again, it's deceleration and change in direction. Look at that. I, I, I should have, I should have been uh, thumbing through this as we're going. Um, yeah, but the question is, do they make you faster? Do they make your feet faster? Oh, maybe, maybe a little bit, maybe it will help a little bit, but again, I think it's really deceleration, change of direction, coordination. Also ladder drill coaching pro tips. Again, benefit of working with athletes for such a long time is making sure uh, we are very patient with athletes. One of the big parts is 
uh, if you have athletes of different skills on the same ladder, so say if you have one ladder, you have four athletes working on it, um, always tell them to not start until the athlete in front of you is at least halfway through the ladder because the last thing that you want is an athlete that is new, an athlete that is not as fast as the person behind them. Here are the footsteps of the person behind them. So they basically kind of freak out, they, they hesitate in their footwork and their, basically their ability to drill, uh, do the drill is uh, significantly impacted. So what we're always gonna do is make sure that that person waits until the person in front of them is at least halfway through before they get going in the ladder. Um, and always walk through the movement and gradually increase the speed. Like I will do that as a coach. I will just say, I want you to go one, two, stick, one, two, stick. Once you feel like you have the movement down, then I want you to gradually increase the speed. Same thing for athletes because their mind will work faster or their perceived, their mind will be, uh, what's the best way to say this? Their mind will be thinking a couple steps ahead of them. So their mind will be in front of their feet. Uh, so what happens is they end up getting tangled up and the drill kind of falls apart. I'd rather the drill be done uh, slow and under control gradually build up the speed as they uh, have that skill acquisition and then go faster. Uh, also great benefits to doing forward and backward. Uh, again, both coordination, but also, you know, what sport, you know, or I should say many sports, you're actually gonna have to, you know, backpedal. I think that's why that backpedal forward to sprint is really good, but having to go backwards is really good for coordination uh, for the athletes. And as always, you know, keep the experience positive. This goes across the board. It is why, um, and again, like there's, there's uh, this is a really big discussion, right? But, um, you know, you have to think about the population that you're working with. If you're working with 10, 11, 12 year olds, screaming at them is, uh, I don't know, I think it's stupid. Um, unless they're doing something very dangerous and you need to get them to stop doing something really quickly. That's one thing, like that they're tackling their friend and could injure them or something like that. But you got to make sure that the experience is incredibly positive. You got to make sure that they want to come back for the next session because, you know, they won't necessarily always uh, see the perceived benefits of strength and conditioning, of doing all this stuff or going to practice. What you want to do is make sure that the experience is always positive. They're, is, uh, you know, again, John Wooden does this, you know, great, again, from working with Mike Bull, uh, translates perfectly to strength and conditioning world. But, you know, always make sure you compliment the athlete on one or two things they did perfectly before you give them some criticism, some feedback. So say, oh, you did a really good job. You know, you made sure you kept your weight back on your heel. You had your shoulders back. That was also awesome. But I just need you to slightly bend your knee. That's all you need to do. And then it'll be perfect. All right. See you next set. All right. So keep the experience positive. And that goes with uh, the ladders. It, it also, let me take a step back. This is something that is super important to me. It was super important uh, at my time at MBSC. Um, but having zero tolerance, this is so important. Whether, again, you're on a team, whether you're in a, a strength and conditioning facility, have a zero tolerance for any bullying at any age level. Zero. Zero tolerance. Like, and this is, I've sent plenty of kids home. And, you know, every strength and conditioning coach can give you stories of, you know, how the parents came back in the next time and be like, you know, why was my son or daughter sent home? And then you would explain, be like, all right, don't worry. They are never going to do that again. And they don't, they usually don't. Usually the parents are able to correct that thing and make sure it, make sure it never happens again. Um, but this, the experience should never be sacrificed for any athlete in the group. Because again, you're gonna have athletes of different skill levels, different abilities. Some athletes are gonna be really comfortable in the weight room. Some are gonna feel like they're on a different planet and they're not gonna to wanna to be there. And those would usually be the athletes. Because like, I totally understand. I remember being you know, 15 and walking into a health club you know, by myself trying to figure out how do I get better at basketball? How do I lose weight because I was very overweight and how do I get some athleticism? And having no idea what to do, just basically you know, being in this completely new and foreign world to me it's super important that every athlete feels like they're a part of the team, that they're included. And that was like a big part of, of allied strength. And I know it's a big part of any successful gym where the athlete should be able to walk in and feel like it's their gym. You know, they should feel like, oh man, like I belong here. Like this is great. Uh, so that is part of just like keeping it loose, keeping it positive and making sure that no athlete 
ruins the experience for another athlete. I would instantly rather get rid of the best athlete, you know, the, the athletes that's on the course to go into, you know, be an incredible college athlete. You know, I'd rather talk to them, see if they can fix it, give them one shot. And then if they can't, go find somewhere else to train because I have lots of athletes that want to be here that are cheering each other on uh, and making sure it's a better experience for everyone else. Sorry, another tangent. Um, all right. So when do you stick voluntary? Kind of like that uh, drill we did with the rings, but they're going on their own pace. So I would make sure the athlete is right about there before the next athlete goes. Again, deceleration, sticking. Deceleration, sticking. And then same thing going backwards. This is super hard. This is super hard for athletes to be able to do this correctly. They will be all over the place, but it just shows the importance of these drills. Cross in front. The old hip rotation in there too. Again, I think a lot of this is, is, is just coordination uh, for the athlete to have like good body awareness for when they do need to turn on the jets and change direction. Cross behind the exact opposite of what we just did. Cross behind in, again, rotating the hips. Again, but this is deceleration and change of direction as well. Like you have to decelerate before you go in the opposite direction. You gotta be able to catch yourself. Scissors ladder drill, we're gonna be moving laterally there. Again, you know, starting slow, and again, it's, uh, I think it's another good, uh, useful coaching tip, is if athletes are having problems with their arms, just having them put their arms behind their back. Um, that's really common in this drill, the scissors drill, where they'll do same arm, same leg, and same thing with some skipping drills as part of the warm-up. If you just have them kind of bring their arms behind their legs, it just allows them to focus on the footwork. And then plyometrics. I'm still thinking about that horn. <laughs> So plyometrics, what's the goal? Of course, power output, absolutely. But of course, deceleration, elasticity, power output. And uh, you know, it's important to talk about jumps versus hops. So jumps would be on two leg, hops would be on one leg. Just to make sure if you are giving a program to an athlete that maybe they're doing like one or two week, days a week at your gym and then doing one or two days a week at the school or at a health club, make sure that you are very specific what you, with what you name everything so they're not uh, doing a jump when it should be a hop or a hop when it should be a jump. So, uh, of course, again, we want power output. Back to that, earn the right to progress. Uh, a lot of athletes will want to progress you know, as soon as humanly possible. They want higher hurdles, higher boxes. But specifically, let's talk about the box jump. I mean, there's no shortage of videos online of you know, athletes and people doing box jumps that are way too high because what they're doing is they're landing with their butt basically at their heels within lots of depth. Now what we want is them to finish in like a half squat, something like that. That's what we want out of that box jump. And you know what I'll always say when I have an athlete that's like nagging to try to go to a higher box, I'll say, yo dude, there's, there's nothing stopping you from jumping higher. You can jump as high as you want, whether it's a 12 inch box, a 24 inch box, a 36 inch box or anywhere in between. Nothing's stopping you from jumping higher. What we're doing with the box jump is we're eliminating the eccentric. That's why it's really good for athletes that are coming back from injury because they're not dealing with as much uh, impact into the ground. We're kind of eliminating some of that. And that's also why it's important to step off the bottom. We'll get to that in a second. I'm getting ahead of myself again. Um, but yeah, earn the right to progress. Coach the heck out of plyometrics. The last thing that you want is sloppy plyometrics they are higher risk than a lot of the other stuff that we'll do. So you have to be incredibly focused on what the athletes are doing and pay attention to them. So let's talk about that box jump, all right? So it doesn't matter like how high, like I could be jumping to this box and still jump as high as I'm jumping to this box. Totally okay. But what's important is if you're going to a high box, you're stepping down to a lower box or you're stepping down to the ground. What you don't want to do is jump to a box and then jump right back down to the ground because you're kind of like, why are you even jump into a box in the first place except to measure how high you can jump? Uh, if you're going to do that, you should just do basically a, a, a jump squat. But, oh yeah, so you mentioned it right there, eliminating most of the eccentric phase, soft landing, land, toe, heel, sit back, absorb that force as you land into that box. And again, where are their knees? We talked about that uh, mini band squat drill. 
Where are their knees when they jump? Are their knees caving in when they jump up and when they land? You've got to keep an eye out for that. Linear hurdle hop progressions. Fantastic. Love these. Love these. And I would even say the first version we're going to do is probably the most important, that stick. Just getting that stick down for those athletes is super, super vital. And what we normally do is five jumps, but just for the sake of shooting narrowly with the turf, we got four on here, normally we'd do five. And then go around to the back, do the opposite leg. So I'm gonna go through this again. So we have three progressions, stick, midi bounce, continuous. We're gonna go back and we're gonna play that one more time. So that stick is really important. We want them to be able to stick and stabilize. We want them to stay in control, especially as we go in to the mini bounce, what can tend to happen is that athletes will actually get out of control. They will be uh, leaning forward so much that they'll lose their composure and basically need to stop because otherwise they'd fall forward on their face. So making sure that we're, we're staying upright, leaning forward a little bit, but not too, too much and still finishing, you know, toe heel on those with the stick to teach them how to keep their composure. So I want to go back to this one more time or even keep your composure, it's probably not even the best term, just to stay balanced, to stay in control of their body as it's moving. Again, you know, the brakes, the fast car brakes analogy. So always sticking that last one, boom. Always sticking that last one. Even on continuous, boom, this is elasticity, stick. Elasticity, stick, boom. Uh, and also, you can do that same progression with two legs as a jump instead of a hop. Uh, but I, again, if I was thinking, like, I have minimal time with these athletes, I think the hop is so much more valuable and transitions so much more into their sport. I would always, you know, stick with the hops if I had limited time. But all the time in the world, we do jumps and hops. Um, again, oh, for those, I also want to mention, like I mentioned before, the speed drills, you know, two to three rounds. That's it. Don't overdo it. Um, because that's really demanding to do these. So lateral plows are more demanding. We're going to move medially and laterally. Uh, also, we're going to do some plow metrics at a 45 degree angle. First is our medial lateral hodo hop. Same progressions on these. Starting with sticking. Same leg, opposite direction. When you're coaching these, make sure you tell the athletes what direction they should be facing at all times because you will have athletes that will Basically, go down, you know, facing this way, they'll go down one way, and then they'll turn around and face the other way, and they'll end up doing the same direction twice. Like, they'll go medially twice instead of going laterally as well. So we need to always make sure, like, all right, guys, what we're going to do is we're always going to make sure that we're facing the weight room while we're doing these. Or we're always going to face this wall when we're doing the lateral plyos. We're always going to face this way. That way, they don't do the same direction twice. We're going to go through these one more time. So again, starting with the stick, most valuable. Three medially, three laterally. Stick, stick, stick. And again, like I, I don't know if they're off camera, but like I have two sets of hurdles. I don't even think I'll need anything higher than these because the hurdle doesn't stop you from jumping higher. Jump as high as you want. Uh, you no, know, you could literally, you know, jump twice as high as that as you want. Just make sure you stick and make sure they're under control. Lateral bound progressions also great. Starting with a strict lateral bound, jumping from one foot to the other. Um, thinking less about distance, like we're not trying to like push ourselves as far to one direction or the other. Uh, what you want to think is like a good kind of arc as you do it. Again, catching. That's that 45 degree lateral bound. You can also go and do those with a mini bounce or a continuous. Um, but again, I, I think for most athletes, what you're going to do is you're going to get like 80% of the benefit out of those first two progressions. That's why I would always focus on mastering those first. Never feel like you need to rush to progressions. Like uh, three, four, even six weeks with one progression, awesome. Master those before you move on. Don't feel like you need to rush to get to the next thing because it looks cooler or you think the athletes are going to like it. No, you got to just do the work. You got to build a foundation, put those bricks down in that foundation. So when you put that mansion on top, it's going to be fully supported. All these analogies. All right, now strength training. Strength training is awesome. All right, more crucial than ever. Keeping athletes competing at a high level, keeping athletes on the field, on the court, on the ice. 
Oh, I did put it in here. Awesome. Athletic armor. I think, you know, strength training is just absolutely vital for athletes today and adults, really. Um, so single leg deadlifts. We're doing, we're working on hamstrings. We're working on glutes here. Um, love the one arm, one leg, single leg deadlift or the single leg deadlift with one dumbbell, one kettlebell, holding that weight on the same side as our trailing leg. And we're going to play this a couple times. Again, these videos are all online. Uh, I really recommend you, you check them out. And we'd always start athletes with a body weight version of this, just like in the warm up, but in place, you know, you could just reach straight ahead as I kick the, the sled behind me. But, you know, reaching straight ahead, keeping a slight bend of the knee of the leg, staying down on the ground as we're doing them. And then you can start loading them up as they build up that body weight ber uh, version. They show mastery. Sometimes, not all the time, sometimes athletes will actually benefit from having a little bit of load, it actually forces them to kind of react to that load and stabilize a little bit better. Um, but yeah, like again, if I'm building like a day one of awesome things for athletes to do, or if I had one day a week with an athlete, we would be doing single leg deadlifts in that one day for sure. It's at the top of the list of great exercises. Uh, kettlebell and dumbbell deadlifts, also great. Again, you know, not doing completely single leg training, doing some uh, bilateral or two leg work, but important to make sure the form is perfect on all this stuff. And it's great to just build up some strength, build up a really strong foundation with these, you know, butt down, chest up, shoulders back, weight should always be shifted back on the heels. And then you can progress to a trap bar della from there. Valve slide leg curl. I think these are absolutely outstanding as well. Um, because what we're doing with this drill is we're having that athlete stay in that hip extended position with those glutes firing and then slowly or eccentrically extend those legs, putting an eccentric force on those hamstrings. Awesome way to build up strength and awesome way to prep those hamstrings for deceleration in sports as well. You can even progress this with a single leg version if an athlete gets strong enough. But again, I would be cool with going with eccentric or that progression that we just saw a second ago as we start adding in regular tempo reps. So this is a five second eccentric as we extend those legs. Complete reset, extend those legs for five seconds. Keep those hips up, hips up, hips up. If athletes are having trouble keeping their hips up, you can have them squeeze something in between their knees like a foam roller or like a, a pad or something like that. Uh, same thing is if they're having any kind of like low back pain. Uh, having them get some active adduction can generally help with that. All right. So why not squat? We talked a little bit about this already. Um, whoops, 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 sorry. Pressing my button. Um, but again, you know, the benefits of unilateral single leg training are well documented. And I think if you want to look at any track record that's just impeccable, like look at what has been done at MBSC for, you know, for years and years and years. Go check out Mike Boyle's stuff. Uh, you know, read his case for single leg training. It's just... Uh, it's just hard to really debate with it. And that doesn't mean we can't do bilateral training. It doesn't mean we can't trap our deadlift. It doesn't mean we can't do goblet squats. But if we're thinking about, again, bang for our buck, maximum return for the time that we have. And also, this is a super important part, you know, making sure that we're challenging athletes as much as possible without having to load them up with a ton of weight. Making sure there's no spinal compressive forces. And also for you coaches out there, your athletes, that don't, uh, you athletes that don't have access to a bunch of equipment like the stuff I have here, you can challenge yourself with body weight with a lot of the single leg work for a long time before having to load it up. Or you can get like a really cheap set of, of used dumbbells off Craigslist or something like that and just have some like light dumbbells to challenge yourself uh, with these. So again, it's, I, I always love exercises where we don't have to just load up the athlete with a ton of weight. It saves time and makes sure athletes that don't have the equipment can still do the movements and challenge themselves and get the benefits. And also, oh yeah, uh, single leg stuff, knee and glute dominant combos because if you're a single leg, uh, doing single leg work, your hip's doing a lot of work to stabilize and to decelerate. Um, really, really awesome stuff. Again, it's hard to debate. It's hard to debate with this stuff. Uh, so again, goblet squat, still good to train the squat pattern. Doesn't mean I'm gonna have athletes squatting 400 pounds. Again, you know, go find me an athlete that squats 400 pounds and I'll show you an athlete that probably has low back pain. Does that help with their sport? I don't know. Um, again, you know, 
you know, I mentioned Michael a lot, but again, it, it just shows like the influence from working there for, for so long and just the impact that he's had on the industry. Because you know, what we've seen is that we can get athletes incredibly strong. We're talking about you know, uh, $20 million a year put pitchers, Olympic athletes, uh, professionals throughout multiple sports, single leg training is incredibly effective. And most importantly, it's very safe because it limits, again, the amount of load the athlete can be using. We're challenging them to, to, to balance and to stabilize. So we again, uh, lunge progressions, like we talked about in that warm up part, but this is where we're loading them up. We can load up a squit, uh, split squat pattern. Sorry, as I'm gonna drink some coffee. We're talking about a split squat pattern. We can progress to a reverse lunge. Again, deceleration, putting on the brakes. Putting on the brakes. Love the reverse lunge. Reverse lunge, you can also do it with a valve slide, like I uh, was showing you before. And that's uh, the idea is to get to a rear foot elevated split squat and then a pure single leg squat. But again, these pads are great that Perform Better has recently put out. Uh, you can always use, whoops, you cannot, let me go back real quick. We're almost done, guys, almost done. Last one, we got one more thing after this, sorry. I know it's a lot, but again, I want this to be like really valuable if I can get my clicker to work. Let's try this. All right, here we go. Split squat. Again, might as well go through this one more time. Reverse lunge. Deceleration. Finishing in that split squat position. 990. Hip and knee. And then those pads, they actually slide if you push off that back foot. So you really do have to push uh, pretty much purely off that front foot, making sure that that heel's standing on the ground. Then conditioning. So the only thing that I really want to talk about with conditioning is the slide board. I think slide boards are absolutely fantastic. There's a reason why they're behind me right here. They're not cheap, but I thought it was so vital to have them here as a part of the training for both athletes and adults because you can do lateral conditioning. Uh, you have an incredible transition of concentric and eccentric force, basically uh, power output and power absorption. Like you're basically decelerating and accelerating on each and opposite leg at the same time. It's super cool and it's really beneficial because you know in every sport that we play, we're gonna be moving laterally, right? Um, there are very few sports that are just you know sprint straight ahead unless you're on a, a you know track and you're doing sprint, sprinting ahead. But we talk about hockey players. These slide boards were usually, uh, they uh, I believe originally developed for hockey players because it simulates that ice experience and that uh, lateral drive that they're having with their skates on. Uh, but it's really great for athletes because not only is it strengthening your glutes, your uh, hamstrings, and your adductors, but you can do it with some endurance as well. Um, so it can help you build up that armor for you know, the end of the game or when you're going into overtime. Also, it's just a really good conditioning drill that is not high impact because we're not slamming into the ground. Again, if you have athletes that complain of you know, knee issues from running and stuff like that, really great alternative. It's low impact. It can also be done on recovery days if you're not going all out. Again, awesome piece of equipment. That's why I have them here. All right, so wrap it up. Again, first off, you know, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this. Um, but the important thing with all this is like right now is the best time to get started. If you're not doing any of this stuff, Start right now. You know, what's stopping you from getting started right now? Uh, stick with body weight movements for on field and on the court training. You don't need a bunch of weight. Again, you can do a lot with the body weight movements that I showed you today, with the drills that I showed you today. You don't really need any equipment. You can get some ladders if you really want to. You could basically, if you're at a, uh, a basketball court, you could put some, you know, tape down or something like that. Ladders are pretty inexpensive though. Um, and you can do these drills, you can practice this stuff without having to buy a bunch of equipment. Uh, be careful with volume and fatigue. Again, this is another big thing for coaching. Uh, be an expert at recognizing fatigue, uh, whether you're a strength coach or whether you're a coach working with a, a sport team, make sure that you recognize fatigue because again, going back to the previous talk, you know what we generally see, again, looking at the research and the statistics that we have from uh, non-contact injury, 
and contact injuries actually, is that we're seeing those injuries happen towards the later part of competition, towards the end of practice, towards the end of games, um, because the athletes are in a fatigued state and their ability to decelerate or to change direction or to stabilize is greatly diminished. Uh, so that's why we wanna make sure that we're building up uh, that armor, building up that endurance, but also make sure that you can recognize the fatigue so you can let that athlete come out for a couple minutes, let them sit down, catch their breath, let their legs recover a little bit before they go back in. Also to recognize dehydration, things like that. Also, uh, let me know if you need anything. AlliedStrength.com, Kevin at AlliedStrength.com. We have an Instagram channel, uh, Allied underscore strength on Instagram that has uh, some educational content on there as well. Um, but if you need anything, just shoot me an email, Kevin at AlliedStrength.com. If you're in the Cape Ann area, never hesitate to let me know. Feel free to come down here. Again, like I said, we have sports performance training offered. Uh, so if you're interested in trying that out, come down. I think you will see that uh, we have by far the best program in the area. There is really no competition. Um, I obviously believe, uh, believe in that firmly because uh, otherwise, why wouldn't I make it better? You know that whole saying that we talked about before. Again, yeah, we offer sports performance training in Gloucester, Mass. But yeah, thank you so much again for your time. I really appreciate it. And hopefully this was really valuable. Uh, if you have any feedback, send it to me. If you have any questions, send it to me. Uh, but again, I hope this was incredibly valuable for you. And again, please just use this information, take action. The worst thing that you could do is spend all this time watching this and then not do anything with it. Um, please, you know, make use of this stuff. Thanks again, and uh, we'll see you next time.